Hey everybody, I don't have my video on because I'm having internet issues, but my name is Chris Stepanuk. I am a program leader with Lake Champlain Sea Grant and a co-leader of this stormwater education series with Ash Eaton, who's been um, you know, all these great directions around the, the chat. Uh, she's our watershed and lake education coordinator with Lake Champlain Sea Grant. And this is actually part of a course that we're teaching at the University of Vermont uh, about using a youth a middle and high school curriculum that talks about stormwater and stormwater education and the series of guest speakers we've had this semester are helping to enrich that we're recording all of the sessions so that we can share them with in-service teachers who are, are have used this in the past or who are using it now or in the future uh, and also have opened it up to all of you in the, the broader community publicly as well as specialists in stormwater uh, to share this information as broadly as we can from these experts that we've invited. So today we're really excited to have two speakers who are gonna tag team talking about the opportunities for green infrastructure in schools and in workforce development and, and education. So we have Mark Companion who works with like Champlain Sea Grant. He's the green infrastructure collaborative manager uh, is a cooperative effort between the Vermont Department of Environmental Conservation and Lake Champlain Sea Grant. Um, and we also have uh, Justin Geibel, who is the Conservation Water Quality Project Manager with the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps. And Justin's actually also a fellow uh, with Lake Champlain Sea Grant right now, as well as being uh, within his career at VYCC. So uh, I will turn this talk over to the two of them. Uh, they'll talk maybe 40, 45 minutes, and then we'll bring on the opportunity for you all to have uh, questions. If you do have questions while they're talking and it's something that you want answered right away, feel free to use either the chat or the Q&A at the bottom of your Zoom screen, and Ashley and I will be tracking that as they talk. Otherwise, we'll just take questions at the end, and if you want, you can type your questions and or you can speak them. We can turn on your microphone to ask questions. But for now, I'll turn it over to Justin and Mark and go from there. Thank you, Chris and Ashley. Welcome, everyone. I am Mark and Justin, say hi. Hello, everyone. Thanks for being here. We're going to tag team here. We'll start out with me giving a, a presentation on sort of the bigger picture. And then Justin will um, present on a, a bunch of things related to VYCC's work. And then we'll come back together and sort of tag team both um, talking about slides for the third section of the presentation. And there'll be some Q&A. Uh, and, and if we can have some discussion, that would be great. So I'll jump right in. So Lake Champlain is a somewhat unique lake. Um, the watershed area is about 18 times larger than the square or the surface area of the lake itself. So the lake is greatly influenced by what happens within the, its, its watershed and how nutrients and pollutants and other conditions uh, affect from mountain to, to lake. Watersheds are uh, interesting, diverse places, many different types of uses. We got highlands, lowlands, water flows downhill, it picks up nutrients and material along its way. Uh, the, the impact of cities uh, have a great, you know, cities have a great effect on streams and rivers and groundwater. Uh, so just to remind us that we're in a watershed and everything flows downhill. And what we do on our property can have significant implications to people downstream. I'll give a, a brief overview of stormwater issues in the basin. Uh, we'll talk about green infrastructure in general, uh, a little bit about what the state is doing in terms of water quality uh, programming in this new Act 76. Then we'll look at some green infrastructure within schools, what's been done in the past. Uh, Justin will talk about the Vermont Youth Conservation Corps and their programming and how they approach things and what they do. And then we'll, we'll both discuss sort of school opportunities relative to green infrastructure. One of the interesting phenomena here in Vermont that's a real challenge is that phosphorus has been applied to the landscape for, for decades and decades and decades. We've basically been importing phosphorus into Vermont in the form of feed, uh, food that we buy, the lettuce and salads has phosphorus in it, 
um, fertilizers for farms. So the soil is already containing a, a fair amount of phosphorus in some areas. The, the phosphorus is bound up to soil particles uh, and some places contain quite a bit of phosphorus in their soils already. When it rains heavily and there's erosion, that erosion can carry soil uh, with it and that soil has may have attached to it phosphorus. So any erosion can actually be moving phosphorus from a stable parked situation in the soil where it's bound to soil particles and make it mobile again and get it back in the streams and flowing down the flood raging waters. So uh, phosphorus is mobile in many different situations and there are other ways that we can park it and, and keep it um, stable and in place. Some significant aspects of, of uh, heavy rain flows can cause economic damage as well. So stormwater has the potential for contributing to adverse water quality effects within water bodies, streams, rivers, lakes. Phosphorus is a nutrient, so when it gets into a water body, it, it upsets the balance of the ecosystem and can encourage certain species such as algae to bloom which can be harmful, which can cause beach closings, may even be toxic to some folks and even dogs drinking water. Impervious surfaces, we have a lot of them in our, in our built environment. Uh, these are surfaces that, that do not let water soak into the ground. They're usually hard or impervious. Uh, and so water flows off these surfaces quite quickly, like a parking lot, a building, uh, sidewalks, and this can disrupt the sort of natural rainwater patterns of an area by water no longer being able to soak into the soil, but now flowing much, much more quickly over the land and reaching streams quickly. And of course, when water flows over, say, a parking lot, it's picking up nutrients, oil drippings, some sedimentation, and taking that with it to the stream or river. Unmanaged runoff can come in different forms whether it's small uh, driveway runoff on, on a private property or the major flooding like we saw in, in previous, a previous slide where the whole road was blown out. Stormwater ultimately will make its way to the groundwater and rivers and streams. And how, how able are these streams and rivers uh, how are they able to, how, how capable are they to deal with the flows that are reaching them? This is a nice uh, uh, stream uh, buffer, a, a stream with lots of buffer plantings on the side. So there's a lot of filtration going on before the water gets to the stream. But streams and rivers can be, are usually the first places that receive the uh, adverse effects of increased stormwater. And then of course, as, we've, as you've been dis discussing and learning, uh, Rainfall patterns are changing. Climate change is anticipated to cause a greater rainfall in Vermont and other parts of the country, which will make these storm events even more acute and more severe um, and cause potentially even greater problems than they do now with more rainfall coming in, in shorter periods of time. So in response to all these stresses placed on Lake Champlain with its very large watershed to lake surface area ratio, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency in the state of Vermont have agreed upon a set of actions that the state of Vermont will do to improve and enhance the water quality uh, in lake streams and ponds and, and uh, rivers within the state. And so the, the, the uh, you may have heard this, it's, it's called the TMDL, Total Maximum Daily Load. Essentially, it's, it's saying that Lake Champlain has the ability to handle a certain amount of nutrients, excess nutrients that come off the land like phosphorus. However, at a certain limit that becomes too much and the lake can't properly um, digest or, or park those nutrients and then it upsets the balance of the ecosystem. So the, the TMDL is basically uh, uh, an estimate of how much, how much runoff and how much phosphorus in the runoff can the lake handle. And so the state of Vermont is required to stay, to, to reduce the phosphorus coming off the land to get to that ideal balancing level so that the lake can handle what's being uh, sent to it. And so the TMDL is a, a set of 
procedures and protocols and benchmarks and milestones for the state of Vermont to, to strive for. And if they do reach those benchmarks, it's generally understood through scientific principles and, and others um, mechanisms that the lake will be okay if we can keep this total maximum daily load of phosphorus at a certain level or lower. So this is what's guiding a lot of the state programming on stormwater management. Uh, so that the Lake Champlain, for Lake Champlain um, specifically, uh, there we go. I'm sorry, I might have just clicked too much. It's a slow delay on my advance. Yeah, there we go. Vermont has also recently within the last year has passed Act 76, which is a new water quality law, which has a number of features that are gonna really benefit Lake Champlain uh, and other bodies of the water in the state. Um, Act 76 creates a new organizational structure for water quality. There will be watershed entities call, called clean water service providers uh, that are managing, identifying and managing uh, stormwater mitigation projects in their area. So it could be like a regional planning commission and its partners and other organizations all working together within their region to identify and create and monitor stormwater projects. So there's a new structure. It's no longer going to be centralized only within the Department of Environmental Conservation, but it'll be decentralized to these different entities set up around different watersheds throughout the state. The Act 76 also creates a dedicated funding source to pay for significantly greater investments in water quality throughout the state. Uh, part of Act 76 will require, it recognizes and requires that maintenance is important, and so funding will be available to maintain these stormwater mitigation systems that are built around the various watersheds. And then part of Act 76 uh, is not a part of the law in a way, but it's a way for the Department of Environmental Conservation to implement is the DEC is developing an operation and maintenance manual. So everything you need to know about how to maintain this or that uh, and what's needed and what are the proper steps and when should you be inspecting and, and maintaining. So, that, so Vermont now has a whole new set of of legal and, and policy tools at its disposal to, to ramp, ramp up the amount of investments uh, placed for or made for water quality improvement. Part of this, I'll just very quickly, part of this um, future of well, existing, but also the future of water quality projects will be the, the permitting. Uh, the Department of Environmental Conservation has a lot of strict procedures in place for what you can and cannot do on a property in order to pr pr uh, protect and preserve water quality. So for example, any, any uh, project that's on one or more acres of, uh, that has one or more acres of disturbance will require a permit. A part of the, part of the um, phenomena that the, the permit process is looking at is erosion prevention and sediment control. So if you're disturbing soil, you're not gonna cause undue sediment getting into the streams. Uh, you also want to capture and filter whatever's uh, construction runoff is flowing off your property. You, you, on construction sites, you've probably seen those orange fences and straw bales around the perimeter of a construction site. Those are meant to capture sediment. Uh, and then runoff reduction in general. How do you keep, keep the flows lower um, during the construction site? So permitting is, is one piece of the puzzle. And so how do we mitigate stormwater? Um, the, the accepted ideal practice for many situations is called green infrastructure. Um, typical infrastructure is pipes and pumps and concrete and hardware, you know, catch basins and drains and things. Green infrastructure goes beyond that by actually bringing natural systems back into our communities and letting them do their magic for treating stormwater. So how do we create a stormwater system in our neighborhood that is as good at stormwater management as a forest, for example. How can we incorporate those biologically diverse natural systems on the edges of our parking lots, for example, to capture, capture and digest some of the nutrients flowing off that parking lot? Some of nature's strategies um, for stormwater is to capture and reuse water wherever possible. So, soils, leaves, plants, they're capturing and they're, they're putting that water into use. 
the leaf litter and debris on the floor of the of the forest or in a wetland or a pasture will do a lot of filtration as water's percolating and filtering and flowing through those those little forests of grasses and things. Um, natural systems also detain and store so the soil will hold and, and like a sponge and hold that water and release it slowly into the groundwater or into rivers and streams through base flow. Um, Natural systems are really good at infiltrating water into the ground. It doesn't really flow very far before soaking into the soil. So the soils are rich, they're spongy, uh, there's lots of debris and forest litter, and even, even in wetlands and in pastures to slow the flow down so that it can soak into the soil and the soil behaves like a sponge. And then finally, natural systems will make some of that water go away by evapotranspiring it back into the atmosphere, making it, uh, pulling it from the roots and out through the leaves so that the water is no longer in the soil or in the rivers, it's up in the atmosphere. And so some of the stormwater management strategies are to slow the flow down, spread it out, and let it soak in uh, to the soil. And that's really the, the crux of green infrastructure is encouraging these nature-based, these na natural-like solutions that have many different species. They're designed in a certain way to encourage water to, to to be filtered, to soak into the soil. And these are the types of infrastructure that uh, are becoming the, the common method for managing stormwater within our communities. And the Department of Environmental Conservation, many, many organizations throughout the state are actively researching and designing and building and maintaining various kinds of green infrastructure. And you've probably seen them around your communities already, um, rain gardens and other things. So wetlands, as we know, are very good at water quality. So what are the features of a wetland that we can incorporate into some infrastructure that we design? Soils are a huge part of it. Healthy soils are like sponges. So when rain falls on the land, spongy soil will soak up that rain and put it down into the ground. If the soil is compacted or poor quality or there's an impervious surface, that rainwater will not soak into the ground and flow over land and potentially cause problems. Healthy soil has a lot of other attributes uh, beyond, you know, one of the sponginess aspects of it is, is the activity of earthworms. They open up passageways and things. So all, and root zones are very, very, um, very friable and loose and, and welcoming and sponge-like for water infiltration as well. So here's just a general image of how green stormwater infrastructure can be incorporated at a school, on your property, uh, at some um, commercial property. Rainwater falls on the land, let's say on the building, flows through some gutters to a, a specific location, you're kind of managing it, and then it's allowed to interact with these natural systems that will filter it and percolate it and slow it down and evapotranspire to reduce the flow and to help mitigate nutrients or sediment that may be in that water. So you may be familiar with a rain garden. One of the green infrastructure techniques, a best management practice BMP is a rain garden. It's a depression, in the, a slight depression in the ground that has um, a mix of, of different plants planted in it. Here's a schematic of it, so a slight depression. And then these plants will, um, and, and the healthy soil and the soil media will slow the flow down and help it soak in and nourish the plants as well. Here's a rain garden at uh, Castleton University, uh, soaking up land from the grasses that are surrounding uh, a couple of the buildings. A constructed wetland at the edge of a parking lot has the ability to digest and break down pollutants. So water will, you can see the curb cut on the bottom of the image, water, stormwater from the parking lot can flow into this constructed wetland and percolate through the gravel and there are bacteria in, in the gravels and roots. It's like a wetland system in a way and that does a lot of treatment. A simple form of green infrastructure is, is a vegetated swale. Just don't mow. Let the thing grow. Put your lawnmower away. For some roadside ditches or other places on a property, it can be very, very inexpensive, beneficial, to just not even mow that part of the, the property uh, all the time. Maybe you mow it every month, once a month, or only once a season, or maybe, you know, or you never mow it. And that encourages these, these uh, 
rich, healthy soils that are friable uh, and, and have open spaces to soak up rainwater. And it doesn't take much. It actually, in fact, it can save money in some ways by just not having to pay the gas to, and personnel to mow that part of the lawn. One of the challenges with um, green infrastructure, like any kind of infrastructure that we create, is how do we take care of it for the long term? You know, you, you know, we need to apply paint to our house every once in a while so it doesn't fall apart. We maintain our car. Well, these natural systems, especially these these engineered green infrastructure systems, need to be taken care of as well. Sediment needs to be scooped out because eventually sediment may build up in, in the front end of the system. So you want to remove that sediment so it doesn't clog. Uh, there may need to be some weeding done every once in a while to, to get some certainly undesirable but, but not invasives out of there as well. Um, and some other, some other uh, mechanical things need to be inspected and sometimes taken care of every, every once in a while. Maintenance is done by uh, one or more people. There's an inspection. How does this thing look? How is it performing? Do I see any problems? You know, when was the last time it was visited? And then what needs to be done to get this thing uh, sort of cleaned up and spruced up and functioning 100% again? And then labor um, to, to do the work, whether it's weeding or removing some sediment. And in the monitoring of these systems, how do we keep an eye on them on a regular basis? We just don't install something on the side of our property and leave it for years and years and years. We keep checking on it regularly, a couple times a season, make sure that there's no, uh, no problems emerging and we develop a plan of action for uh, mitigation. So green, just a few images of green infrastructure at schools. There have been a number of schools within the state that have had green infrastructure systems installed as part of a stormwater management system. They could be part of a, a stormwater permit that the school has with the Department of Environmental Conservation. It could just be that there were some problem areas like ponding on the schoolyard or some erosion areas on the school property that they wanted to address. So some green infrastructure systems were installed to, to um, resolve or mitigate that problem. Here we can see some natural uh, like plantings on the perimeter of a parking lot and you can see the curb cuts uh, on, on, on the parking spaces. So the water can flow from the parking lot into this grassy, wetlandy like gravelly uh, green infrastructure system to be treated. Here's a system at Howard Union High School in, in uh, Faston. I think it's Faston. Yeah. Um, and this one was designed so that students can interact with it. They can take water samples and they can be doing some, um, use it as an outdoor classroom. But it was collecting, it is collecting a lot of runoff from the roof of the, of the, the school building. Here's another system at Poultney High School. It's a small little rain garden in this sea of asphalt. It's, it's probably the only life in this large area, but it's, a, it's doing some stormwater mitigation function. It may not be large enough for the area that it's serving, but a lot of water is flowing off this large expansive parking lot into the small rain garden to be treated. And like we say, constructed wetland is another technique uh, that could be found on some school properties as part of a stormwater project that had been done in the past. This is uh, Warren Elementary School. Yes, Warren Elementary School has some green infrastructure. So a question is, how does a school begin to take care of this over years, over its lifetime of 20 or 30 years? And so with that, that's kind of an introduction to green infrastructure and, and stormwater in general. Um, and I'll turn it over to Justin who can discuss the work of VYCC and how it intersects with uh, the need for a skilled workforce uh, to work within green infrastructure. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, we were doing our best to not make this transition too just clunky, um, but the formatting is all over the place, so just bear with us. Um, so yeah, kind of want to just describe, uh, I don't want to be just all a promo for VYCC, um, but I want to kind of describe where uh, VYCC is sort of involved in this conversation. Um, and how we kind of uh, want to be aligned with a, a lot of this work that's happening. Um, and it, uh, so 
kind of describe my relationship um, with Mark and the Sea Grant and, and where we're kind of involved in the conversation. So to start with, I'm just going to kind of walk through a little bit of, of what we do. Um, so it was kind of actually kind of glad to see that there weren't a ton of U, uh, VYCC alumni in the group. Um, so this isn't going on uh, people who already know this stuff. But so VYCC, uh, we are a nonprofit. And basically what we do is we hire, we train, uh, and we employ youth and young adults uh, and put them to work on meaningful projects throughout the state. Um, that's really at, it, at its core what we, what we do. Um, so in normal years, uh, COVID, you know, the exception of course, but uh, we normally hire between 250 and 275 humans uh, throughout our sort of busy season uh, um, across all of our programming. Um, so uh, Mark, you can go to the next slide. We have sort of two main buckets of programming um, that we uh, that we run. Uh, next slide, if you can, Mark. Oh, if you can go back one. Okay, happy <laughs> right to do so. So, two main buckets of programming. Uh, one is our food and farm program, uh, which we'll talk a little bit more about. If I saw one person volunteered for us, uh, so. Um, we have a couple of components of, of that. And then our conservation side of things where maybe the more traditional, uh, what you might think of with a conservation crew, but that involves quite a bit, quite an array of, of different types of work that we do, including water quality, which kind of ties us in here. Uh, next slide, Mark. So the food and fire program, um, just briefly. So this uh, operates mainly out of our uh, HQ in, in Richmond. Uh, we have 50 acres of farmland, uh, 10 of it is for uh, vegetable production, uh, and we got about 40 acres of grazing for chickens, cows, pigs, things like that. Our crews that are employed on the farm, they help, uh, they help grow vegetables, uh, harvest them, and they either get sold through our uh, farm stand or through our healthcare share program. Sorry that the twins just woke up from a nap, so they're, they're outside the door. Uh, and that's basically a farm to hospital program. So um, hospitals will prescribe patients uh, with diet related illness or, or disease, um, fresh organic produce that comes from the farm. So our crews grow it, harvest it, and we distribute it to, to these folks throughout the state. So just a quick recap uh, on our farm program. Uh, next slide, Mark. And on the conservation side, sort of under that umbrella, um, again, there's quite a suite of types of work that we do. Um, one big portion being our uh, trails and our parks restoration. So this is really meant, all of this work is varied, but it's meant to improve and increase access to outdoor space and reduce its impact. So you see folks here uh, armoring trail tread, um, building some punch in there, building a composting toilet and a, and a privy. Um, so it kind of encompasses that area of work. Next slide. Forestry, um, kind of a, a nice analogy somewhat to what we're talking about here, but uh, kind of a new program. Um, we are in the second year of a, uh, of a contract uh, with the Northern Borders Regional Commission uh, meant to enhance uh, forest health and build out a workforce um, around forestry and timber stand improvement. So um, you may be looking at those pictures thinking that doesn't look much like a Vermont forest um, and it's not, that's actually North Carolina. Um, in prior to 2018, we had sort of a satellite operation down in North Carolina, which is where we did a lot of our forestry work. So uh, next slide, Mark. So that brings me to our water quality program. And again, I am the water quality project manager at VYCC. So this is sort of my wheelhouse. Um, and Mark, in his the beginning of uh, this presentation, really laid out sort of the, the environment for clean water in Vermont. And that's really um, what we've been operating in for our whole history, our 35 years, but more intentionally, uh, maybe in the last decade or so, uh, really devoting our time and resources to water quality work and helping the state achieve those goals. Um, so like all of our conservation crews, these are folks working in small teams uh, throughout the state, uh, mainly by hand. Um, we sometimes have some support with some equipment, but uh, on the picture on the left-hand side here, this is a crew, uh, Sarah Hoffmeyer is down there with that group. She presented last week, so I'm not sure who all of you were, were 
in that. But so this is actually in the construction phase of that rain garden that she presented on. Um, they moved a lot of soil, uh, but she was fantastic. And I'll probably be coming back to some of the stuff that she uh, had described in her presentation about the maintenance of that, that rain garden. But um, so next slide, Mark. Nope, I went the wrong direction. So again, a wide variety of work that we do uh, in the water quality realm. Um, this is some work, this is lakeshore stabilization. We do a lot, of, uh, a lot of erosion control, sort of on the smaller scale that uh, a lot of folks, municipalities and other um, land management groups can't quite get to. We really have that niche where we can um, apply these small fixes that have a larger landscape um, effect as they accumulate. Next slide. Another example of uh, some of the uh, our specialty. This is a culvert header in Montpelier um, that the city, you know, it uh, just it was a little bit out of there. Um, you know, they had bigger bigger problems to deal with. So these are the types of things that we can come in with a crew. We can be very um, mobile and we can be nimble and we can use our resources really um, intentionally. So uh, when a, a road crew would typically just dump a whole lot of stone uh, onto this hillside and, and pack it down. We're able to be a little bit more uh, intentional and, and create something that um, is effective and, and lasts. And next slide. And one other, uh, the riparian buffer sort of uh, work that we do, um, you know, we were able to uh, get out there with lots of diff different partners and use a lot of different techniques. So this group is uh, installing willow fascines uh, into this uh, this area that is just below a, a dam that was just removed. So uh, basically trying to shore up all this sediment that has been collected there um, with these willow that will uh, regenerate and, and grow uh, root systems and, and try to hold all this intact. So just to give you a little bit of a cross section of kind of the work we do, um, green stormwater infrastructure is another component of that. Um, you can go to the next slide. So when we're describing all of these different programs and all of these different areas of work that we do, we really use three main sort of buckets uh, to evaluate um, the, the value to us and, and really um, if it's in line with what we, um, what we do. Uh, the first is being the value of the work. And um, if we're speaking directly to operation and maintenance, uh, of GSI, but also of um, a lot of the other types of work that we do, um, riparian buffer plantings being one of them, um, you know, the, the continued maintenance of those things uh, is critical to their, uh, their function. And it's one of the most, the, um, the biggest needs out there that we can see throughout our, with our partners. Um, we're constantly being asked, can, we, can you come pull some invasives from this riparian planting? Or can you come clean out this gravel wetland, um, and really the, one of the biggest barriers, which goes to the sustainability side, is has been the funding um, source for that. So up until, um, you know, X76, there really hasn't been a, a, a good funding source to get this work on the ground and, and get it accomplished. Um, and really another big piece, uh, which I'm going to focus a little bit on, is, is the member experience, is what we're really um, really focused on as an organization across all our programming. So we look for ways that we can help individuals uh, into professional development um, pathways, into, uh, into careers um, through, through their experience with us. So um, that's another component that we're really sort of um, looking at when we're thinking about this operation maintenance type work. Uh, you can go to the next slide, Mark. So why, um, again, this is a little bit looking into our crystal ball of, of what the future looks like. Um, right now, we don't have a really built out um, operation and maintenance um, program. Um, we hope to get there and it's for a number of reasons. One, um, if you look at just the, the industry, the, the momentum that is, um, is building behind creating these installations and, and constructing them and, and getting them across our landscape, uh, we know there's going to be a lot more of them. Um, we also know that there is going to be an effort to maintain them uh, and uh, to continue monitoring. So we see this as a really growing uh, industry as well as becoming more complex. Uh, so 
we'll talk a little bit more about that. But um, you know, with from a typical um, landscaper or um, you know technology that we've used a lot for stormwater in the past, this adds a lot of complexity. Um, and the way that Sarah Hoffmeyer from last week was describing the efforts she's put into to maintaining that rain garden that that we built, uh, it takes a lot of knowledge, um, a lot of effort, um, and an understanding of how the system works. Um, you know, it's far beyond just, uh, you know, riding a mower. So we see this as a growing field um, that demands more complexity and more understanding. Uh, and also, uh, we see for the young people that come through to us, uh, young adults are looking for alternative career pathways um, in a lot of different fields and a lot of different ways. So uh, again, that professional development opportunity that uh, is has a huge potential for um, how we can provide a service to the young folks that come through our door. Uh, and we also, um, I've been focused and through my partnership with Sea Grant, have been focused on the educational outcomes of our, our programming. Uh, and we see the value of project-based, um, problem-based learning uh, and hands-on learning that these folks get, especially at the young adult age, um, it being super valuable for their their development um, and their learning. So uh, we see the model as a really uh, great opportunity to both um, serve the members that come to us uh, and help them into what is a, a growing industry um, and also uh, you know, help the state achieve its clean water goals. Um, so next slide, Mark. So just to sort of wrap up again, what um, looking into the future of what we hope to um, to create among VYCC, but uh, as far as you know, an operation and maintenance um, sort of scheme throughout the state, there's a few sort of questions or, or possibilities or opportunities that we see. Um, one being training programs for operation and maintenance contractors, that both being us, but potentially for other contractors, um, you know, maybe there's a, a landscape company who wants to connect with some of this work. Um, getting them the baseline information for them and their employees about uh, the technology, how it works, um, all of the different complexities that are go well beyond what a normal landscape company might on, do on a regular basis. Uh, again, like I said, I think there's a huge opportunity for career paths um, into um, GSI, stormwater management, design and construction um, as beyond the operation maintenance for, uh, for our members as well as the, the general public. Um, maybe there's a potential for, um, you know, th it, this being connected to higher education um, at, at various levels um, to help people get hands-on experience, um, help this industry and help, you know, our state's water quality while pursuing, um, you know, higher education. Just a question mark. Uh, and to sort of segue back, uh, a rough segue, um, we see with the school programs, um, you know, with a lot of schools currently having uh, GSI on their properties, many more schools soon to have these installations. Um, we see a lot of really uh, great opportunities for interactions between UICC, the folks that are doing the operation and maintenance, and the schools, staff, faculty, parents, um, and a really synergistic sort of um, connection there. So, um, Mark, you can. Okay, thank you, Justin. Now we're going to do tag team and um, we'll both, we each may have something to say on each of these slides, but maybe, uh, maybe not both of us. So a question will be, uh, how do we inspire and prepare the next generation of practitioners of green infrastructure? From a school perspective, since school properties will be having uh, increasing amounts of, or there'll be increasing amounts of green infrastructure on school properties for water quality purposes, how can we um, help students want to learn more about these types of, of uh, career opportunities and the interdis interdisciplinary nature of working with natural systems? How can students be using the green infrastructure out on their schoolyard as a science laboratory, as an outdoor classroom, um, taking samples, uh, notes, sketches, drawings, learning about you know, botany and flowering, all with the infrastructure that's on their schoolyard? 
How can we design those systems on the school property so that they are accessible to a student? Um, they're not, you know, isolated. They're not dangerous for them to walk down in and, and take measurements. They might have um, pipes going down in the gravels. They can drop a, a, a sampler down into the below, below ground level and, and collect some samples. How can we think of bringing ecosystems or part of ecosystems into the classroom for continuing the study when uh, the outdoor systems are, are dormant in the winter time? So can we have analogs of portions of wetlands or aquatic systems that we can study and do experiments on and not damage the ecosystems outside? How can we think of our school yard in a much more broader perspective. Uh, how can we increase biodiversity on the school property? Uh, how can we work with the uh, landscaping crew at the school to kind of rethink some of their mowing strategies, for example? Restoration ecology. This is a school I worked with in Portland, Oregon years ago. They took a tennis court at the middle school and dug it up and made an ecological garden out of it. So the students were part of that entire process and it became an, an outdoor classroom and laboratory for the students. Uh, rainwater harvesting in the background. So restoration, trying to reclaim part of our properties so that they are not just acres of mowed grass, but are there sections or portions of that that we can let behave a little more differently and be a little wilder or be you know, food production centers, all as part of the curriculum. Can we introduce or encourage other species to come back to the schoolyard? Bats and butterfly gardens and bird birdhouses, all part of establishing these aquatic systems and, and all student driven, all, all integrated into the curriculum, a hands-on curriculum. Can we Consider portions of our school property that do not need to be manicured and mowed all the time. Can we let the grass grow tall for much of the year or part of the year? If so, where are those sections? Uh, and how do we work with the landscaping crews and facilities managers of our school so that they are understanding the, not only the water quality benefits of these, but how to actually manage such a place? Constructed wetlands, again, how do we use them not only for water quality, but also as a laboratory? Another cool concept that could inspire students is this emerging concept in the green building, the sort of lead certification aspect of construction, net zero water. You may have heard about net zero energy. How can my building or my property produce its own energy and not have to import energy? Well, the same can go for water. How can my school property or my house or some lo location be self-sufficient with its water needs, capturing water uh, from the rain, reusing it where practical. So net zero water is a, a concept that's actually very interesting to a number of students. It gives them a sense of the larger purpose of why they're doing this particular activity in the classroom. And then also professional development. How, how do we help the teachers begin to be, feel more comfortable conducting these kinds of conversations and, and, and facilitating these acti activities with their students. So what kind of training or um, support might school, system, school uh, personnel need and teachers to help champion some of these ideas? And so that's what we've got. Anything, any, Justin, anything else on what I just went through? No, I think there's a great opportunity. Uh, you know, the way I describe VYCC's thinking is we're really looking at the, you know, uh, post schooling to their career, sort of that transition of, of young adults and getting them that sort of work experience. Um, but I, I, I see a, a tremendous opportunity to, um, to begin giving students uh, these hands on uh, introductions to these concepts um, with. Uh, in conjunction with you know the the water quality benefits that we're getting from these GSI installations, so um, you know I think as much as we can support utilizing that resource um, in all those different ways that Mark just described is tremendous to think through. So, what do you think? Questions, comments, suggestions? We open it up to the group.
Great. Thanks so much, Mark and Justin. So um, checking the chat box now. I don't see anything in there, but I would encourage folks, if you want to ask a question, you can um, raise your hand uh, as a attendee and we can allow you to talk if you have a question you'd like to ask yourself. If you'd rather put a question in the chat box or in the Q&A, um, Chris and I are happy to, to moderate that um, if you'd like to put a question in there. And so let's see. Well, I have a question while we're waiting for okay. questions to come in from the, the audience. So uh, just a question for Justin, like what's the, what's the schedule and of, of recruitment? So if there are students here who are, say, hey, I think that VYCC might be something that I might want to do, how do they know and how do they sign up and when's, this, when's the circle and what's the schedule of them working and things like that? Great question. Um, so typically we start our, our season, it's a little more amorphous now what, what will look like next year but typically we start hiring for all these programs and positions uh, over the winter starting around in january um as far as so I, what i can say is that we will most likely <laughs> we'll be looking to specialize some of these crews so especially for the young adult age groups um, we're going to be looking at hiring water quality specific crews forestry specific crews um uh build which we're coining as build, but it's sort of a more of a carpentry focus. Um, all of those will be kind of coming down the pipeline in, in January or so. Um, so keep an eye on our website for sure. And if you have any specific questions about programs, um, feel free to, to email me directly um, and we can talk about, again, with just beyond COVID, but with a lot of the initiatives that we're um, taking on, it's you know, things will be kind of shifting as far as what particular positions look like and things like that. So I'd love if anyone has questions, I can keep you um, in the loop as we continue building out those programming. That makes sense. And do they need, um, like, does somebody have to be like a forestry major to be on the forestry crew or can they come in with no experience? Um, if you, it depends on the position. If you're looking to uh, be a crew leader in a particular crew, then we, we're looking for um, some experience in that in that field. Um, but as a as a member, um, as a young adult member, um, you're it's really based on your interest uh, and your willingness to um, to dive in. So with our forestry crews, typically we'll be involved in that training. Will be some some saw training, um, like a game of logging, a couple of levels there. Um, so no particular experience, just um, an interest and a passion for a particular area. Awesome, thank you. Great, and I just popped the link to the um, Vermont Youth Conservation Corps um, website into the chat box. So if folks wanna click on that now and save that for later, you'll um, know where to go. We have a question coming in the chat box right now from William and William is asking, are there examples of where GSI structures have measurably reduced contaminants or phosphorus more specifically. This seems like it would be a powerful tool to gain funding and support for future projects. That's a great question. Um, Mark or Justin, do you want to? Um... Yeah, uh, the genesis of green infrastructure was a lot of research on how do these things behave? How do they perform? Uh, how should they be designed? What attributes are more important than others? And as the literature was uh, growing, a bunch of uh, stormwater folks were starting to, to identify how to design these systems. How should they be designed you know, um, from an engineering perspective? Uh, and then all that was based on the understanding, the research showing that certain characteristics of green infrastructure are really good at holding phosphorus. So water flows in the, uh, from a parking lot or from the land, enters the, the, the inlet of the green infrastructure system. And as the water flows through that green infrastructure, say it's a rain garden, phosphorus is, is either parked or stored, um, held and bound up. Um, before what before the water then flows out the back end. So these systems are proven to have the ability to intercept phosphorus that's flowing through them and hopefully store it. Uh, but there are, it's not a perfect system. I and mean, some of these, this is where maintenance becomes important because as a system gets old and tired or it's been around for 10 or 15 years, 
it might not be performing the way as well as it did when it was designed. Maybe it's getting full of phosphorus. There's, there's very few binding sites on the soil to hold more phosphorus. So phosphorus now begins to pass right through the system rather than being intercepted and stored within the system. There's also the, the phenomenon of, um, uh, just escape me here, the, um, of the phosphorus, I, I, sorry, I just, I just lost that idea, it drifted out of my head. Um, but these, these systems, oh, when, when, for example, when conditions change within one of these green infrastructures, such as if water is staying too long in the system and it's ponding, uh, that anaerobic condition can release phosphorus. So uh, these systems can be really good at holding phosphorus and other times they may not be so good depending on if there's too much water or if conditions have changed, but they, they, they do have the ability to intercept phosphorus. And that's what the literature had shown by years of research on how natural systems do that. Did that answer your question, William? Yeah, I think, I think that definitely spoke to the point, Mark. Thanks so much for that. And I think, um, great, yeah, Will says yes in the chat box. Um, right. and, I, and I think one of the things to think about, and that's, why, um, and that's why I think today's talk is so important when we think about workforce development, is that it is really difficult to pinpoint in advance how much remediation for specific contaminants that you are going to receive because there's so many complex factors, as you're saying, Mark. You know, what's the soil type? What are you putting in? What's already existing? What's the flow rate of that area? What's going to be coming into that system? How does it need to manage the water? And so I think, you know, as both you and Justin talked about, understanding all of these different systems and how they interact is really important to both the design and the maintenance of these, um, you know, of these green stormwater infrastructure pieces. And I think, um, you know, as we're seeing more and more on the landscape here in, in across Vermont and across the the nation, I think it's easier to understand the benefit that um, that is happening. And I know there's some great work happening here at the University of Vermont on just doing just that, William, starting to research and understand, um, you know, a, a little bit more about some of these projects um, and their viability for certain areas, because some of them are certainly better for um, specific contaminants than others. And, and it gets more complex to, to understand them because they're interdisciplinary. I mean, to, to be a, a an effective practitioner, you have to have an understanding of botany, of biology, you know, biochemistry, engineering practices, you know, soil health. It's not just you're a concrete expert and you can pour concrete and then you're done. Uh, you know, you have to have an understanding of all these different disciplines and how they interact with each other, which is a, a quite a unique skill set for creating infrastructure. You know, we usually have structural experts who build the bridges and buildings. We have transportation experts who design the, the roads and bike paths and railways. Uh, but now with green infrastructure, you have to have a little bit of many different disciplines under your hat to kind of begin to understand or figure out what's going on in this system. And I think in terms of career opportunities, these systems are still pretty young. And so the students that are in school right now or thinking about going back to school, you know, for graduate school or whatnot, I think there's a really big opportunity to, to think about, well, what are those maintenance needs and can I have a niche area where, you know, I'm going to be the person who knows the plants and this is what over time, maybe we need to harvest the plants to move phosphorus away from the system or harvest part of the plants, if you will, um, so that we can pull more phosphorus out, or maybe there needs to be other kinds of maintenance that's done over time. So I think that the operations and maintenance piece is one that's a really, uh, it's a growing field. There's an opportunity to go to grad school to research it or to work in that, that realm um, as a career. And, and back to the, the slides I talked about with, you know, um, habitat restoration, the outdoor classroom. One way to potentially inspire younger students is to get them involved with these cool things of building a bad house, of, of doing some research on these stormwater retention system on the property, of learning about botany, uh, about the water cycle on the school property uh, or in the school uh, as, as the context for all these uh, important skills that will be needed when you're actually on the ground working with systems out, out in the wild. Yep, and we, that's what the basis of this this course that Ashley and I are teaching is again that soaking up stormwater curriculum for its upper elementary, middle, high school uh, 
teachers and students to do exactly what you're talking about, Mark, learn about the stormwater, what it is, how to treat it, how to monitor for it, and to engage in stewardship projects that can help to have these systems work uh, over time. Yep. Any other questions? Yeah, so I just prompted folks to, to drop questions in the chat box to use the Q&A. We still have just a, a couple minutes here. Um, so if anyone has any questions, now's a great time. Um, you can also raise your hand and we'll um, let you ask your question if it's a little bit more complicated. While questions are coming in, I'll just make a comment on this, this image here. This is from Malcolm Wells, his book called Infrastructures, where he dreamed about what would infrastructure of the future look like. And the caption that went with this particular image is, wouldn't it be fantastic if our human engineered infrastructure was as useful to other living things as it is useful to us? <laughs> it's, a, it's, a, it's a very fascinating way to approach design. And what is the, who is our community for? Yeah, that's great, Mark. That really gets at the crux of sustainable um, design and sustainable systems thinking. Uh, there's a question coming in right now from Lynette, and Lynette is asking, I think this is geared towards you, Justin, how do projects get lined up with VYCC? So if somebody had a project and they wanted to incorporate the VYCC crews, how would they go about that? Oh, all sorts of different ways. Um, so really, for each uh, kind of component of the project work that we do. So it mentioned forestry and trails and um, water quality, whatever sort of genre is it, it's in, we have to have a project manager that basically is in charge of um, getting out there, connecting with partners and, and identifying projects and you know getting them through to uh, getting crews on the ground. So um, you can contact VYCC in any which way, um, myself, regardless of what kind of work it is, um, and we'll basically plug you in with a project manager and come out and visit the site, check out what you have going on, see how it fits with our, our crews and our capacity, and um, we go from there. That's great, Justin. And if there's a like a general email for VYCC that you want to toss in the chat box, um, I think that would be helpful for folks. If not, I can try and find one in a, in a second here. Um, um, yeah, I can change that. Chris, is there anything else that you want to chat about before we release folks? I know we're rolling into about one minute here. Um, left yeah, the left. only thing I would say is we don't have a speaker next next week, but two weeks from now, we have Ruth Beecher, who's one of the teachers who took our course, this course last year, and she's going to be sharing what she did with her classroom actually during the COVID uh, shutdown of schools uh, to install a, um, a rain garden, pollinator garden area at the school. And then to wrap up the series, we actually have a speaker coming in from Illinois, uh, extension who we will be talking about green infrastructure and equity and diversity and for that one for everybody who registers in advance we're going to be sending out a couple of readings and a story map to explore in advance so that we don't have people just coming in blind to that conversation uh, so that will be on December 7th and third so two more speakers great uh, and thanks, Chris, everybody. Thanks, um, Justin and Mark, for being our presenters. What? And those dates, Chris, I think you cut out, was it was November? 23rd and okay. December 7. Great. Okay, awesome. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Justin um, and Mark. And thanks for everyone that joined us today. Um, thank you, everyone. Yeah, thank you.